So this is on the cultivation of civic friendship by Maisha Cherry in the Journal of Philosophical Research. Oh. And as always, please feel free to uh, ask questions along the way. Hope everyone out there is doing all right. And uh, this for our buddy Aris. Um, He's uh, listed right here in chat. If you want to click, if you're interested in philosophy, if you are new here and you're interested in more philosophical content, he's the first link there, Aristotle. Um, you can ask him basically anything, ethics, uh, ancient, uh, ask him anything, but he also, he works on friendship, so maybe he'll find this interesting. Okay. Uh, Evolve Yourself was also in chat, and there's a uh, philosopher, philosophy booth every so often under Ask a Philosopher. <coughs> okay. So, we don't read abstracts. In Overdoing Democracy, Robert Talese claims that democracy is being overdone. <laughs> what, like cooked too long? <laughs> what do you mean overdone? And it's being overdone because of how we view and treat each other. More specifically, when we see others as only political agents who, is either, ob who either obstruct or help or enable our own political projects, and we become steadfast in political activity and engagement, we are overdoing democracy. When, we, when everything we do together is either tied to our political allegiances and every place we go is politically saturated, then it's clear we need to do less, not more politics. This, for Talese, is not an undemocratic recommendation. Rather, it's a call to put politics in its place. When we fail to put politics in its proper place, we dissolve the other social goods that democracy requires if it is to flourish. That is, that... Uh, Excuse me. Thus, such overdoing becomes counterproductive to the aims of democracy. I'm not sure I buy this, but like she's this is obviously the uh, opening paragraph where uh, she's setting stuff up. Like the last paper, also, we were set up, <laughs> and then the kicker came later. Um, why would you write this paper focusing so much in this way? Well, then there was a payoff for focusing on it in focusing their philosophy in that way. So I'm going to assume uh, Maisha Cherry, yeah, Cherry here um, has some has some goal in mind. Okay, continuing. Talese rejects the notion that democracy is boundless and should be expanded, even though the temptation for thinking so arises out of deliberate deliberative democracy. Although we aspire towards deliberative demo democratic practices that include talking, arguing, objecting, providing reasons, and informing ourselves, this doesn't mean we ought to do it at every turn and everywhere. When our everyday activities serve a as prompts for the intensification and radicalization of our political identities, which in turn exasperate our political divisions, then we know we need to do things differently. And Talese shows such overdoing makes even deliberative dem democracy unproductive. This is due to polarization and the oversaturation of politics, which lead us to see our opponent as irrational, untrustworthy, apt targets of enmity. Polarization also leads us to create information bubbles in media spaces, and it makes our social spaces politically homogenous. Um, I mean, I'm not 100% sure about this. Like, it may be the other way around, it, that the information bubbles, um, these are what lead then to the polarization. Um, not that there's polarization leads to the information bubbles. Like if, and by information bubbles, I mean, if you're getting media, media from, uh, say like only Facebook, the algorithm only pu uh, pushes certain things for you to see. And then you only see certain things because, you know, that's what you engage with. But like, that's a limited sort of, uh, selection of what's going on. Okay. So here we go. Finally, we get to. Here's the question mark. What prescription does Talese offer? The solution isn't found in more political activity. Better democracy initiatives in the form of enhanced deliberation venues do not suffice as solution to the problem of overdoing democracy, and in the absence of measures of other kind, they may even exacerbate it. Politics shouldn't be all we do. The solution is that we should do non-political things with each other, activities that allow us to obtain the social goods that democracy allow and that nurture things beyond politics. And Talese's proposal is enabled by civic friendship. Civic friendship can solve the problem of overdoing democracy by desaturating social spaces, getting us away from homogenous environments, and helping us to counter enmity. 
In this paper, I examined the possibility of civic friendship to solve the problem of overdoing democracy, paying close attention to how it can counter effective polarization and social homogeny. In section 1, I explore civic friendship as a solution to polarization. In section 2, I argue Talisa's civic friendship in the context of non-political collaboration is akin to Aristotle's utility and pleasure friendships. Given the nature of civic friendship in section 3 through 6, I make amendments to Talisa's proposal. I argue that if civic friendship is to address not only desaturation but polarization, and it has these Aristotelian features, then the cultivation of taste, equity, and ethical attentiveness are necessary. Okay, so here's what it looks like we're doing. It's like we're, this is going to be an Aristotelian, a pro-Aristotelian uh, account of friendship and how it will be corrective to um, current political woes. I mean, is this feasible that like if everyone were just to get along better, then maybe our politics would be less bad? Maybe, maybe not. Um... But so this is this really gives me a fit feeling like, man, can't we all just get along? Like, stop like being all like overblown. Like, stop being so focused. Just like everyone get along first, and then you'll like then work out the politics later. It's like uh, I'm a little wary of people that say this sort of thing. It's like yeah, just everyone get along first, and then like it'll be okay. Yeah. If every like I just like that seems weak nowadays. It seems like we've got bigger problems than if people could just get along. The politics politics is getting in the way of people just getting along because that is very successful for the politics and so the idea that you have to just get along first is uh i, I feel like putting the cart before like it's missing the underlying pro problem here but okay <clears throat> let's see what sherry has to say civic friendship and polarization when thinking of friendship philosophers are likely to immediately think of aristotle aristotle's taxonomy Aristotle makes a distinction between friendship of virtue, pleasure, and utility. Talis suggests that civic friendship friends are different from typical modern conceptions of friendship. They don't need to know each other or interact. They don't even have to like each other. Their friendship consists of mutual respect. This respect is grounded in regarding each other as sharers in a social enterprise, entitled to play an equal role in shaping and di directing that enterprise. Such friendship is an ongoing joint activity that involves characteristic dispositions and behaviors. A general term that captures these capacities of regard, respect, etc. for Talese is civic friendship. The capacities and dispositions of constituted dispositions constitutive of civic friendship enable citizens to uphold their investment in democracy even in the wake of political losses. Talese divides these faculties into self and other and other regarding capacities. Yeah, this is like this is like sort of co-workers. It's like civic friendship, co-workers in like the project of being, you know, we're co-workers as being like in the being, you know, all in the same country. We're all working together to make our country great. And so these are our friends in terms of like, you know, trying to make our country better. Make America great again is this sort of like civic friendship idea, <laughs> which is really sad and sick. But like in like sort of the, the uh, way this works, it's like that's exactly what you're talking about. You're all in this together. We're all, you know, trying to make America great again. Not again, I guess. <laughs> like, yeah, I feel like I should make some snarky comment or something, but it's taking too long in my head. <laughs> I'm tired now. <laughs> Okay. Reasonableness and sympathy are examples of other regarding capacities. The capacity of reasonableness... Oh, God. Alright, this is one of the, my bugaboos. There is no such thing as being reasonable. No one knows what it is to be reasonable. There is no good definition of it. Generally, whenever someone says be reasonable, that means they just don't like what you're saying and they don't have anything better to say. So they're saying you're being unreasonable because you're like what they consider to be the standard quo you're going against. But anytime someone says, oh, reasonableness, like you're being unreasonable, like uh, I find that hand waving. So reasonableness reasonableness and sympathy are examples of other regarding capacities the capacity of reasonableness involves hearing and listening uh okay so there's a lot of things regard require hearing and listening when exercising reasonableness we provide reasons in favor of our views and revise them if necessary 
and we trust that others can be responsive to our reasons. Now see, this is exactly what it is. People always like their reasons better than other people's reasons. And that's why people say be reasonable is that you're not taking my reason seriously enough. But again, that means they just think what they're saying is important. And that's why I, I get annoyed about it because generally they're not defending their reasons. They're saying you're just not thinking my reasons are good enough. Um, or they don't think my reasons are good enough. They just want to be like, oh, my reasons are better than your reasons. It's like, okay, this is, this is the problem. It's the responsiveness to it. It's like, that's what people say when they say you're not being reasonable. Okay, we are in response also willing to listen to their challenges to our commitments. Another cap capability is dem democratic sympathy. Exercising democratic sympathy consists of regarding others with fellow feeling. Even when we judge their views to be distasteful or misguided, fellow feeling doesn't allow us to conclude that they are therefore unfit or disqualified from citizenship. Democratic sympathy helps us recognize that they, like us, aspire to deploy democratic politics for the sake of their sincer sincerely held values. While it seems that these self and other regarding capacities, which are constitutive of civic friendship, are only appropriate when we are engaged in politics, Talese disagrees. He claims that civic friendship involves more than using these capacities to engage in politics. Civic friendship is not one-dimensionally absorbed by the travails of politics. Moreover, to cultivate civic friendship requires us to exercise these capacities beyond politics, and this is possible only when we are able to regard each other as more than our civic roles. Civic friendship involves acknowledging each other as equal persons who li whose lives are devoted to valuable projects and pursuits that lie beyond politics. On one hand, this is a descriptive claim. It articulates the fact that citizens don't just have civic roles but familial, communal, and leisurely roles as well. On the other hand, there are normative claims that follow from the description. Given this fact about our lives, we should recognize we should then recognize each other as such that is more than our civic roles, and we should also engage each other beyond the civic roles we have. To do this, Talis suggests that our efforts to cultivate civic friendship must begin from encounters and cooperative activities that do not make salient our political profiles and division, endeavors in which po politics is not merely suppressed or bracketed, but risen above. In other words, we should engage each other in other activities and roles beyond the civic, being careful not to pollute it with the travails of or primacy of politics. We should instead enjoy together the social good that de democracy brings without saturating those encounters with our political commitments. I'm getting one of these like horrible flashbacks to a, like com uh, like business building things that like uh, like uh, we all go like away together and trying to like a. Uh, like team building i've never had a good one i know people who are very rich and have like fancy companies have like fun team building things in like cool places i've never been to one of those but like this is what i'm getting it's like yeah we should need some do some team building here and then we can go work out our uh problems when we get back to the office yeah okay we may immediately detect the tenability of this recommendation when we reflect on our interpersonal relationships. To enjoy the social good of leisure with my best friends, it would be easy to convince them that politicizing our time is a waste of time if we are to truly enjoy our time together as well as the activity we are currently engaged in. If we can say the same thing about our family events, although I'm sure many will still find it tempting to transgress, we should see each other in our familiar, familial or filial roles and not our civic ones if we are to enjoy our activities yeah it's, this is the old no uh politics at the thanksgiving table thing like keep it out of the family <laughs> the controversial aspect of talisa's argument has to do with the extension of the normative claim beyond our current interpersonal relationships talisa's recommendation is not just for intimate friends and family who do in fact know each other and often cooperate with one another he claims that civic friendship should be cultivated to extend outside of our intimate worlds, and that means we should attempt to see strangers as more than their civic roles. And he claims the self and other regarding capacities of civic friendship can only be cultivated when we do so. These capacities are necessary for solving ubiquitous destructive problems in our society, polarization. Yeah, it's like, this is like, okay, can we go see the people that we are already annoyed with as like you know these are complex interesting people with like their lives and stuff like that is one of those like yeah sure go like see like your enemy as like a full human being it's like that sounds great i don't know how uh, practical it is though but yeah 
I mean, that's the suggestion. If you could only see people in a better way, then you would somehow recognize that they're not stupid and idiots for having disagreeing with you. Yeah, disagreements with you. Excuse me. Okay. There's platform polarization in which members of political parties diverge sharply on nearly every issue. There is also effective polarization in which there is high distrust and antipathy between groups. Together, it's not just that liberals and Republicans can't agree on anything, but they also dislike those who they see as their political opponent with whom they disagree. Talese acknowledges that the United States has a high level of effective polarization. This polarization is not simply the result of disagreement, it's due to the political saturation of social space and sorting. Citing social psychology and political science studies, Talese calls our attention to research that shows that when we are around people who think as we do, our beliefs intensify, our opposition grows more resolute, and our attitudes become more uniform. In other words, we become more extreme across several dimensions due to this sorting problem. The sorting problem manifests in social space. Our social spaces are not only saturated with politics, but where we go are often spaces saturated with people who share our political orientation and signify theirs, thus creating homogeneity. I can't speak anymore. Homo homogeneity. homogeneity. Yeah. This sorting and saturation contribute to belief polarization because when our everyday activities serve as prompts for the intensification and radicalization of our political identities, they exasperate our, exacerbate our political divisions. And it is this problem that Talese thinks civic friendship, along with its capacities, can help solve. In the next section, I will examine and respond to Talese's prescriptive claim that civic friendship can serve as a solution to polarization. Instead of questioning its tenability, I will offer up important amendments. I will argue that a deeper attentiveness to the nature of Talese's account of civic friendship requires that we cultivate additional capacity of civic friendship to adequately respond to effective polarization and thus help put politics in its place. Given such a task, it's important to begin by returning to Aristotle and the nature of friendship. Okay, so what this looks like here, just in my head, is that this is um, what Cherry's doing here is, well, as far as I can tell, is that they want to push this Aristotelian thing here, this Aristotelian, Aristotelian view on the nature of friendship. And what they think is certain things are very important in that, but they don't have the, um, they don't want to argue for the whole thing themselves. They want to just you know, like push the few things and then they're using Talese as a, you know, a jumping board, a starting point. And so they're just going off that. And so in some sense, we're not talking, like they said, they don't even want to criticize Talese. Like that's what they're going to do. They're not even talking about that, but they just, just like, well, we're going to use the Talese framework and then just build from there. So this is kind of one of these, uh, this is interesting that like, uh, they, they're going to say what they want to say, but like they're, they're frame, they're putting it within this other framework so that they don't have to do all the work themselves. So it's kind of like a response article, but, uh, it says, look, all right, you're, what you said is great and we're not going to criticize you, but what we're going to do is we're going to take a slightly different task, uh, tack. So, yeah. <clears throat> Civic friendships as utility and pleasure friendships. While Talese refrains from provoking long-standing debates among philosophers about the precise nature of friendship, I think attending to them, albeit briefly, is important. One philosophical account I think worth attending to is Aristotle's. In what follows, I will argue that Talese's account of civic friendship fits two, not one, of Aristotle's distinctions. And this gives us reason to cultivate additional capacities that can help us attend to the distinct nature of civic friendship and address the sorting and saturation problem. While Aristotle proposes three types of friendship in the Nicomachean Ethics, two of them are worth noting for our purposes, utility and pleasure friendships. A friendship of utility is based on what we gain from it. For example, business partners and consumer hairdresser relationships share utility friendship. The business partner relationship is based on the profit that they will gain from their relationship. The consumer hairdresser relationship is based on the consumer getting satisf satisfying service and the hairdresser getting a fair monetary exchange for providing it. A friendship of pleasure is based on the enjoyment of a shared activity or the pleasurable emotions the parties provide each other. 
Examples of pleasure friendships are workout partners and erotic relationships. Workout partners enjoy going to the gym, running, biking, or hiking together. In an erotic relationship, partners share the feeling of love and joy. In both examples, participants enjoy each other's company and they live among one and they live among one another. Utility friendships and pleasure friendships are reciprocal friendships. Rather than being necessarily exploitative relationships based on only only on the gain and enjoyment participants both receive, these friendships can and often do involve worthy qualities such as trust, communion, and dependence. Yeah, I mean, you can have a really good relationship with a business partner that, like, you know, you make a lot of money, but you also get these, you know, trust them, you have a good relationship with them. So, for all those people out there that have uh, good uh, work environments, you can be, like, happy to go to work. <laughs> I don't know how many people have great work environments anymore. Is Talisa's civic friendship an example of utility friendship or pleasure friendship? It may appear that the answer is utility. At least, at least this is how political theorist Danielle Allen, in Talking to Strangers, describes such a relationship. Allen reminds us, inspired by Aristotle, that citizens are utility friends. The core activity of the friendship is equity. Utility friends, like citizens, share in power and aim to achieve excellence at living together. These utility friendships help us recognize that we share a common good, that we need to cultivate equitable cultural habits, and that only equitable rather than rivalrous self-interest is able to help us all benefit and maintain our social bonds as citizens. John Cooper, echoing Aristotle's influence, also notes how civic friendship is a type of utility friendship. Civic friendship, then, as the special form of friendship characteristic of this kind of community, is founded on the experience and continued expectation on the part of each citizen of profit and advantage to himself in common with the others from membership in the civic association. This is to say that civic friendship is a kind of advantage friendship. These accounts of civic friendship as utility friendship matches onto, well, matches or latches onto Talisa's account. However, there is more to say about the nature of civic friendship. Talisa's civic friendship also fits the criteria of pleasure friends. Uh, you having sex with your government, Talisa? I don't know what that looks like. I mean, the uh, Constitution is very sexy, of course, but yes. Okay. Contrasted with the buddy who engages with us in some activity and depends on the reliability of parties in supporting and accompanying each other in some limited and often sharp sharply delineated activity, friendship for Talese has to do with the variability of endeavors that they support and enable. Although Talese is careful to clarify his recommendation so as not to be interpreted, interpreted as him suggesting that citizens form friendships or gather together, but rather they cultivate within themselves the dispositions toward one another that are constitutive of civic friendship, the details of his proposal seem to contradict this stated aim. For as he says, if our efforts to cultivate civic friendship must begin from encounters and cooperative activities that do not make salient our political profiles and divisions, then some of those encounters will be face-to-face -face interactions. This gathering element is implied by his recommendation of doing other things besides politics. Doing things together is not an abstract cultivation endeavor. It occurs through interaction of a shared activity. So while he is not suggesting that we become best friends with any and everyone to solve our political, our polarization problem, on my reading, he suggests that we recognize and engage with people beyond our civic role, roles and political activities and affiliations. This entails forming the dispositions to engage in pleasure activities. For these reasons, we can view Talisa's account of civic friendship as an example of both utility and pleasure friendships. In our civic friendships, we recognize that we all have civic roles, but we also recognize and engage others beyond this role as we take up non-political activities where we enjoy social goods. You know, there's a, the old story is like you go, if you're going to go someplace, you go, you go where people eat, you go have a meal with somebody. And it's like, everyone enjoys food. Like we're human, we have to eat. And so like, if you can sit down and have a nice meal with people, then it's like, yes, then you can in some sense, see what they enjoy and get beyond whatever their, uh, this sort of the utility friendship here where like you're all working together to some goal, but like, yeah, if you can sit down and have a meal together, it feels like you're doing something different and there is value to that. That's like an old, uh, old thought. Okay. 
As previously stated, this combination of utility and pleasure friendships is not a strange idea. We have them with our close friends who happen to also be a co-citizen. And if Talisa was only concerned with relationships of this kind, then the recommendation would only address the desaturation issue and inadequately addressing the sorting problem. I take Talisa's claim to be that we should cultivate civic friendship with those who aren't already targets along this utility and pleasure dimension, and doing it will not be easy. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. You have to go seek out your uh, people that are not in your uh, political spectrum right now. <clears throat> and that's hard, excuse me, that's hard because of the way our technology sorts us, uh, already pre-sorts us. Like, so all the services you use online are usually the algorithms are set up to show you more of what you already like. And that means you are not engaging with people in a wide spectrum of beliefs. It's just showing you more of what people who are already like you. And so the idea that we can go make friends with other people is harder nowadays. And the technology is set up that way. So it's a problem. Okay, author says, therefore he recommends the capacities of dem democratic sympathy, persistence, and reasonableness. However, since I argue that civic friendships are not only utility but also pleasure friendships, there are there are other capacities that are needed. More specifically, we need to cultivate the capacities and dispositions that are necessary to have as we do other things besides politics and do them in a way in ways that diminish polarization. So is this like is like literally what her suggestion is is that like we set up a uh, play date app or like a dating like kind of like a dating app a play date app where you're getting like uh, people on the left and people on the right here in the United States to go like do something fun because that's exactly what this sounds like this is like go date your political go have a play date with your political enemy and it is apparently been uh, a complaint I don't know if it's true but it's again the media I'm looking at it's that like there's been multiple conservative dating apps and they don't really they're not good because more people in the cities where dating apps are most effective are going to be more liberal and so the conservative dating apps is basically it's not getting a wide range of people and so again by self-selection and media sorting you are not gonna be in a position to meet people that disagree with you and so the idea that like you need a date, like a, a way to get meet new people, it's very hard because again, there's self-selection and also the uh, algorithms are not incentivized to do this sort of thing. So is not only is it not easy, it's even harder nowadays. Okay, cultivating taste. Aristotle notes that pleasure friendships are unstable and unlikely to last. I mean, I guess. I mean, you can always. Depends. I don't know what Aristotle says. I don't remember that. They often don't last because our pleasures change. Pleasure friends' temporality is due to our fickleness. Okay, Juggling says, So far from what I'm experiencing from this paper are ideas of let's get along and thoughts of thoughts and definitions from other philosophers without a lot of interjecting her ideas until just now what she takes from Talese. Yeah, I agree. Um, granted, this is a slightly longer paper than I like reading, but I am reading it. And so we are yet to get to the meat of the paper, really. I, I think it's coming up. So, yeah, I, I don't think a whole lot has happened yet in this paper. But again, uh, we ha like this is a slightly longer paper than I want to read. Like normally I get somewhere faster, but that's fine. I'm expecting there to be more. If there isn't, it'll be a little disappointing, but c'est la vie. It is philosophy roulette, after all. You don't always get what you want. You get what you land on. <laughs> yeah, I agree, juggling. We're getting somewhere. It's just a little slowly. And to be fair, most philosophy writing, even though I try to read shorter things on philosophy roulette, most people are like, and I notice this, they, they try to, uh, you know, develop in a somewhat methodical fashion so people who this is just kind of how it's written they have all the space and they like filling it in i don't really like i just want give me the answer this is philosophy this is not like literature there's very little pleasurable about reading a lot of philosophy i mean some of it is but a lot of times it just isn't so it's like i just want them to get on with it but a lot of people seem to you know they want to you know pr proceed in a sort of methodical slower way and uh that's just sort of the sociology or like the typical writing style. So 
It's like that's where we are. Okay. You may find pleasure in video games today and have and have online and in-person friendships based on them. You know, hey, we're on Twitch. However, next year you may give up gaming and become a cinephile. You are likely then to dedicate your leisure time to watching and discussing films. And we have a cinesemiotics in here sometimes who is a uh, does film theory. And your pleasure friends will change from those you've gamed with to those you now those you now share a love of cinema. Yeah. <coughs> although pleasure change, although pleasures change, there are some things that you might never take pleasure in. You might live your whole life never enjoying soccer, museums, fishing, dancing, dancing, traveling, or sushi. There are some people who will never find pleasure in attending a basketball game because they enjoy baseball. There are some who enjoy American comfort food and frequent Cracker Barrel, but will never go to a hibachi grill. What problem might different tastes pose to civic friendship? It may appear that there is a link between what we find pleasure in and our political orientation. Talese points to the fact that our commercial spaces have become more socially sorted and hence more politically homogenous. In Dunkin' Donuts and Chipotle, you are likely to encounter a certain clientele, given that these companies often target customers based on their political identities. For example, Dunkin' Donuts targets conservative customers, Star Starbucks targets liberal Democrats. Juggling says, agreed, I could read the other philosophers' thoughts or learn from the source, but I also understand this is more of a slow burn style with an introduction and then getting to the meat, different preferences ultimately. Yeah, and I think um, you also have to realize, I feel like this is uh, part of the structure of philosophy publishing. They, the editors get a lot of papers in, and so this gives everybody, you know, a little bit of a base to work from so everyone sort of writes in a very similar way and so this gives you know the editors and reviewers sort of a, a pre-set structure to uh work from and that way they can understand like it's one fewer thing that you have to worry about like if all the papers kind of look the same in terms of structure then everyone can like focus on the content that's not a good thing because the structure and the content a lot of times are related, but you know, in papers like this, I find a lot of the stuff is kind of just like, this is how it comes out. So it's like, that's okay too. Um, and sometimes it's also very important if you are looking to get published in this sort of area to look at the structure of the papers, because if the editors get in a paper that deviates too far from these structures, you're not going to get yourself published. And uh, that goes for any sort of uh, writing area where you're dealing with editors and reviewers. If you get too far out from what they're expecting, you're going to have more trouble. Like, not that you can't get published, it's just that you're going to have to do more work to uh, justify the uh, alternative structure. Okay, continuing. Is our political orientation shaping our taste, or does taste shape our political orientation? I do not know the answer. However, what I do know, given the aforementioned consumer facts, is that if we want to solve the sorting problem, we will have to do things or enjoy social goods with those whose political commitments and taste are different from our own. The question is, what capacities then should we cultivate to achieve the same? I mean, I'm going to say, like, go get do donuts at Dunkin' Donuts and at Starbucks. Like, <laughs> so I'll... Uh, Cherry says, I believe the answer is taste. Really? Okay. The answer is taste. We should cultivate our taste to make room to do other things besides politics. Now, this doesn't mean that we should attempt to change all of our preferences for the sake of befriending any and everyone we encounter, nor do I intend to imply that we should cultivate taste with the goal to make friends. Rather, I am suggesting that if the sorting problem arises not just in social space but out of aesthetic pleasure and preference, that this is satisfied within social space, then the cultivation of taste is a solution to the problem. Okay, so we finally got somewhere. What the fuck does this mean, though? Like, so, like, uh, if more conservative people like baseball and you like basketball, maybe you have to learn to like baseball then? So you can hang out with the baseball people? Um, again, does this put the cart before the horse? Because, like, assuming you, like, let's just assume that's the case. I don't know if that's the case um, based on the demographics of baseball and basketball in the United States. But let's say um, it is the case where baseball is a hard 
a conservative or and the basketball's hard liberal. The commentators are going to be more using conservative rhetoric in baseball and then they'll maybe using more liberal rhetoric in basketball. So it's not going to be just um, learning the game. It's going to be learning the lingo and what's important in the ways that those people do it. And so the question is, if you were... Is there? How do you actually get over that to like the conservatively described game versus your liberally described other game? And so it's like, it's not so simple that like, oh, you'll like baseball. It's a great game. I mean, I agree. I love baseball. It's a great sport. And same as basketball. But like, it's not so clear to be like, oh, there's something inherent to like about this. There's a lot of inherent things to like about lots of stuff. But cultivating taste is uh, easier said than done. Okay. Cherry says, I define taste as eat and Eaton does when she writes, to have a taste for X then is to have the standing disposition to take pleasure in X based on some of X's properties, whereas to have a distaste for X is to have the standing disposition to be displeased or the dis to be displeased by or to have an aversion toward X based on some of its properties. Taste that I think should be cultivated is not only aesthetically excellent, for example, art, but more importantly, everyday aesthetics, for example, food, sports, environmental, since these are things we are likely to do together besides politics. Just as restaurants can be politically homo homogenous, sports are also likely to be too. Basketball may draw in more liberal-oriented fans than hockey, and hockey may draw in more conservative fans. If I am a hockey fan convinced by Talisa's proposal, I should attempt to cultivate the disposition to take pleasure in basketball based on the proprieties of, of athleticism, physical competitiveness, etc. This will open up the possibility to do things with people with different political orientation besides politics and do them in ways that address the sorting problem. Okay, so here's the thing. This is what I was just saying. That you have to find neutral things to like about stuff that you might not like otherwise. So, like, yeah, if you find a conservative sport and you want to understand conservatives, go appreciate the sport for athleticism or whatever, and then have that as an in to understanding the people and what they like and how they think about stuff. Okay. Really difficult. I mean, I'm not saying you can't do this. I'm just saying that sounds hard. Okay. How do we cultivate everyday aesthetics so we can tackle the sorting and homogen homogenous problem? Back to Aristotle. To cultivate taste, it's not enough to tell people to hang out so that they can enjoy social goods together. Any philosophical argument would be insufficient. This is because reason doesn't cultivate taste. Therefore, Aristotle calls taste unreasoned. No argument can convince a basketball fan to become a fan of a sport they have an aversion to, for example, hockey or baseball. No argument can convince people who enjoy Southern comfort food to now enjoy Asian cuisine. Like all virtues, Aristotle thinks we train our taste through habit habitation, repeated exposure, and repetition. To cultivate a taste for a sport will come about by watching or participating in hockey games, attempting to enjoy it with hockey fans in order to gain a greater appreciation. Cultivating taste for a certain kind of cuisine involves giving it a try, and not just once but several times, perhaps at different locations in order to gain an appreciation. But exposure and repetition alone are not enough. Consider Eaton's explanation concerning acquiring the taste for vegetables. Craig, quote, Craig is disgusted by vegetables, but because he knows that they are good for him, he wants to make them a regular feature of his diet. Further, Craig A. knows incorporating vegetables into his diet will be easier if he doesn't merely tolerate vegetables, but if he actually likes them, and B. wants to be the sort of person who enjoys eating healthy things. Repeated exposure to vegetables might get Craig to tolerate them, but he wants something more. He wants to actually acquire the taste for vegetables. Craig tries to alter his feelings about vegetables by acting as if they were tasty. He starts with vegetables that are most similar to things he does like, such as meat, and he incorporates them into a dish that he already likes. Finally, it is important that he creates positive associations with vegetables by initially restricting his consumption of them to times when he is enjoying himself and performing visualization exercises where he vividly imagines himself eating vegetables with vigor and enthusiasm. <coughs> I'm sorry, I think this is really funny. I don't know, like, because uh, I'm an omnivore, I eat all the things. So, like... This visualizing eating food I don't like, I don't have a problem with that. I'm trying to think of something else I could do this with. 
Sally the Alder Boy. <laughs> Welcome in. How you doing? Um, and you will like vegetables, damn it. Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, <laughs> Sally is a buddy of mine from uh, the Electric Mermaid community. He is married to Electric Mermaid. So let's give uh, Sally a shout out. He streams things like ESO and uh, I think he was reading some scary stories tonight. So you can go check him out. And uh, he's a good guy. So yeah, if you have any questions, I'm reading philosophy at the moment, which is what I do way too much of on Twitch. <laughs> if you have any questions, let me know. But yeah, we're discussing here um, how to fix political polarization by making friends with your enemies, basically. Go make friends with your political opponents by, you know, doing stuff you don't like with them and learning to like it. And then maybe you'll see them as better people and be less angry with them. But, uh, I know I'm making that sound bad, but seriously, Sally, you gave me five bucks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bezos bypass. And I hear it's a special day. So that too, um, Sally, I told Mermy that it definitely was not my birthday today. Absolutely. Definitely. It was not my birthday. It's not my birthday. I was making a joke. I told them that and they, uh, Refuse to believe me that it's not my birthday because I was making a joke and it really is not my birthday. My birthday is in July, <laughs> but they refuse to believe me. And I told them this and they just, well, they ignored what I said. So, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, but I appreciate the uh, tip. <sighs> so, continuing. <laughs> for Craig to cultivate a taste for vegetables, he must expose himself to them. <laughs> Sorry, I'm finding this hilarious. I feel bad now. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I don't uh, envy you some of those difficulties. <laughs> For Craig to cultivate a taste for vegetables, he must expose himself to them. But he must also act as if he likes them and as if he is a person who eats vegetables, using some self-important desires and inclinations as a strategy. You see, this is why this is kind of funny. Like, do you really think you can convince yourself to like something you don't? Didn't someone say it was your birthday during another stream? Yeah, I was lying or I was joking juggling. Like, someone might have said that and it was like... It's, but, like, I, I really, did, like, I did say that October 23rd was not my birthday in a very facetious way. And I may have repeated that a few times. So people would get the wrong idea, which was the idea of the joke. But then I also told people that it wasn't, it really wasn't also. But yeah. Yeah, see, the thing about this, uh, Sally, is that it's faulty. The author knows it's faulty though this is like a real the person who's writing this is actually quite a good philosopher they know it's faulty that's not what they're doing right now though like th this is a setup again um they're gonna say something they want to say but like this is a uh, they know what they're doing yeah but like this is what's going on here and um i don't know exactly where they're going with it but like this person is not i say this a bunch i said it earlier tonight these people are very very smart they know what they're doing. Yeah. You know people like this? I know lots of people like this. <laughs> uh, but yeah. But yeah, so we, you, you gotta, like, we were just talking about this with uh, juggling earlier. They were, they didn't look like they were doing anything, and then all of a sudden they started doing stuff, and now this is the beginning of them, like, doing stuff, and it's kind of a setup. Okay. Or, I mean, do you, are you meaning, like, people who, like, try to train themselves to, like, food this way? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's how it goes. And I can't guarantee you that it's good philosophy. In the end, they may still screw up. Like, this happens all the time. Like, people who are good don't have always, don't always have great arguments. Like, sometimes, everyone has a bad, an off day, too. So. So, similarly, we can cultivate our taste for sports or food. Recall Cracker Barrel versus Boxy Grill by doing the same. Like, can you actually learn? 
it's fair. Like if you there is a sport you don't like or you don't know, you can learn more about it and then you will you can get into it. Like that is kind of how th see this is this is really the thing. Aristotle was no fool. This is an Aristotle theory. Aristotle realized that if you learn about something, you can get sucked into it. This may it's not an like he's been criticized for the last 2000 years that just doing something over and over will not make you like it or make you good at it but he knows that this can happen if you like start playing sports with people just for whatever reason you might end up liking it it's like one of those like you try it you might like it it's like he's not stupid like that that is a thing okay in addition to exposing ourselves to hockey or southern comfort food, we can act as if the sport or cuisines are amazing and that we are fans of them. If hockey is too far outside our comfort zone, we can start with a sport that is more like basketball but still attracts people who are different from us. Or we can start with a cuisine that is like southern comfort food but whose restaurants attract people with different political orientations. When we engage in these activities, we can also create positive associations. For example, we might watch a basketball game at a bar after experiencing the, euphor the euphoria of watching a hockey game at another bar well, you'd be very drunk at that point or we can imagine enjoying different kinds of foods with enth enthusiasm like craig such cultivation of taste can attend to the sorting problem and help us enjoy the social goods of democracy with others you see that's the thing maybe you don't like hockey but maybe you like bars so you can go to a bar that's showing hockey you know might not be the dumbest thing in the world if you want to go meet new people like combine two things one thing you like with one thing you don't like and maybe you'll get lucky and find someone there that is a kind of an agreement with you cultivating our everyday aesthetic practices are not irrelevant to our civil practices our cultivation of them allows us to expand our boundaries and interests of people who may have political orientations different from our own eaton makes a similar moral claim concerning our taste toward our bodies she argues that physical attractiveness impacts how we treat and evaluate others we perceive those who are attractive as more intelligent and trustworthy this halo bias impacts our hiring and promotion practices those who are not attractive those who can those considered fat or ugly are discriminated against, not only in hiring, but in health care. And so she recommends we cultivate our taste toward fat bodies. I am claiming that what we take pleasure in can affect how we treat and evaluate others. In addition to political polarization, what I am calling pleasure bias, the toleration and or enjoyment of others who share our tastes can impact how we treat others. Cultivating and thus expanding our pleasures and tastes can open another way to be around or enjoy social goods with those whose political orientations are dif different from our own. And now we see the point again. Uh, Cherry wanted to make up something called the pleasure bias where we're biased towards things that we like and is it using this um, sort of stuff to sneak this in right here. That's kind of what I see. This looks like they're sneaking a point that way. They're sneaking in what they're calling the pleasure bias. And so this is sort of, this is a, a substantial claim where it's saying, look, we all know that like people are favored that you, if you think they're uh, attractive now, okay. But what we're going to try to do is we're going to make a pleasure bias to our, uh, to our benefit where we are getting, um, political, uh, power out of it. So if you can then make coalitions with people that you do not agree with politically by using this pleasure bias not just you know you know i scratch your back you scratch mine but if you uh go beyond just the utility of uh quid pro quo then you can actually do uh a you can have a stronger political uh platform and this is where i think uh cherry is coming in here she wanted to say this, but like she can't just make that out of the willy nilly. So she she embedded it in this other um, sort of theory. <coughs> Okie dokie. So cultivating equity. Recall Talese suggests that we do other things than politics. He writes, try taking up some cooperative project or endeavor that you regard as not having a determinate political valence. It ultimately does not matter very much what you choose to try. The important thing is that you do something that you sincerely take not to be an expression of your political, your, your particular political identity. He believes that these activities are likely to cultivate civic friendship. I agree. However, it's not just about what we do with each other that cultivates civic friendship. It's how we do it. Within each, jeez, I'm losing my mind here. In these activities, we need to make sure that we are incorporating equality. 
Allen suggests that in the absence of such equality, friendship doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Strangers can converse or even hang out with each other, but if they don't act equitably towards each other or, or are unwilling to share power with one another, they don't count as friends. Talese doesn't ignore equality in his account of civic friendship. He thinks that the mutual respect that is constitutive of civic friendship is grounded in regarding each other as sharers in a social enterprise entitled to play an equal role in shaping and directing that enterprise. Nevertheless, the capacities that he focuses on fall under reasonableness and sympathy. I believe, however, that more can be said about the equity and the importance of cultivating it. Equity, at least according to Allen, is the fair distribution of burdens and benefits. It's about attending to balances and imbalances. It's tempting to think only about equity in regards to political endeavors, accepting political losses, sharing in political governance, and attending to and remedying overburdened communities are examples. However, we should not neglect equity in our non-political engagements. It has an important role to play, for it allows us to fully enjoy the social goods. Therefore, cultivating equity is important if we are to put politics in its place. What is this saying? It's saying everyone needs uh, baseball tickets. Like we should have like, uh, you know, everyone have a little bit of fun, like free uh, tickets to the uh, Six Flags. Yeah, well, I don't think <laughs> author says, I do not think this is as easy as we think it is. I don't think this is easy at all. I don't even I don't even know if this makes sense. Like equity is a very hard thing. But anyway, author says Alan seems to disagree. She thinks that equity and leisure and cultural activities comes come easier than the equity that is required for for political friendships. She writes, Citizens have gotten fairly good at collaborating in musical and, and, and athletic exchange, but when it comes to share institutional power across racial lines, for example, our cooperative skills frequently break down. People don't like sharing power. That's not new. I mean, you can play, it's like, you can, do, it's the old story here in the US. You can do whatever you want, just don't like, you know, uh, change the uh, social class structure. She doesn't provide an example, but we can easily imagine one. It seems easier to share roles, parts, or positions in art and sport, in sports in order to accomplish a goal than it is to share institutional power in governance. The supporting actor accepts his role, responding to the leading actor in kind to produce a beautiful, moving the theatrical production. Team members accept their roles, make sacrifices, share the spotlight in order to beat their sport opponents. What's harder, at least according to Allen, is applying that shared cooperative tendency to institutional contexts like the movie industry and team ownership. This accounts why uh, African Americans make up the majority of NBA players, but executives and team owners are predominantly white. It also accounts for the fact that although women are equally on the movie screen as men, the majority of producers, directors, and heads of studios are men. So perhaps it is easier we engage in other institutional endeavors. However, easy, easier doesn't mean easy. Easier doesn't mean that equity is natural without difficulty and ubiquitous in activities geared towards enjoying social goods. How should we do other things? How should we do other things than politics? We should do them equitably. This requires the cultivation of equity. Like, seriously, this is saying we have to change all of society at this point. It's like, I'm not saying we can't change all of society. I'm just saying that hard. Like, we don't change that fast. Like, things really don't change that fast. And, you know, if you stir the pot too much, you get in a lot of trouble, too. So, <coughs> it's ain't easy. And, like, if anyone has any ideas on how to, like, you know, make the world a better place, you let me know. But, like, it's not so easy. People try. Okay. Doing the other things that Talese suggests without equity is like being is likely to be counterproductive in the aim of putting politics in its place and addressing polarization. This is because unequitable practices are likely to sow seeds of distrust. How can we mend effective polarization when one's unequitable actions in non-political activities can generate more enmity? Inequity is also likely to cause harm to people's self-esteem, dignity, and standing, thereby creating division when some do not play by the rules. This damage and rule-breaking are likely to generate claims and disagreements not only that not only halt our collaborative activities, but can invite politics into social space. So we need to cultivate equity in order to guard our collaborative activities against these harms. All right, so this is saying if we made everything else fair, politics would follow? I mean, again, if we could make everything else fair, that might be the easier thing, and then, yeah, politics would follow, but sure. I mean, okay. Easier said than done. All right, Cherry continues. 
Cultivating equity involves the disposition to act fairly without bias. It also involves the disposition to play by the rules, not expecting to be an exception to them, and tolerating no favoritism. For this to occur, rules and communal expectations should guide our pleasure activities, and we must develop the disposition to follow rules and hold each other accountable to them. And the rules should be rules of fair play. Acting equitably in practice, for example, involves creating rules for the book club that all participants agree to, clearly laying out behaviors that prompt exclusion and following through on their enforcement. It's listening to and giving everyone a voice in sharing their ideas and feelings, being careful not to privilege some voices over others, or talking too much ourselves. What? I can't talk too much myself. I'm in the just chatting category. Fuck you. Acting equitably would involve playing by public park rules and we go to enjoy the social good of an environmental space at the same time as in as or in collaboration with others we will not treat ourselves as exceptions if there is a no dogs without a leash policy we will respect it and if there are minor disputes that occur in the space we will try our best not to play favorites i mean again we can't even get people to do the no dogs without a leash policy it'd be nice if we could but i mean like Go check the news about dogs and leashes in Central Park, and you'll see how bad things are nowadays. <coughs> I feel like this is still taking a lot for granted. Yeah, I feel like, um, like I feel like Cherry has done better work than this. Is this is just sort of uh, a little bit weak uh, as far as I've seen things from her that's better. Now, that's okay. You don't have to write everything like it's hardcore, um, but I agree. Um, sure. Uh, let's see, where are we? We're on page 10 of 15. I think we have three more pages to go. So there's still, like, some more stuff to be said, but we're getting past the uh, meat of the uh, paper here. And sometimes there's a kicker in the last few pages. I don't know, but we're, we're going to find out. But, yeah, it's not like, um... Yeah, I'm just not seeing a whole lot. So, we'll see. And it's okay. Not everything, like I said, not everything has to be, like crazy they had one interesting point with the pleasure principle before that i was saying but um this equity thing is like this is nothing new like yeah it'd be nice if we made society equitable like okay okay acting equitably equitably also involves the disposition to share in power this can include taking turns sharing power and a book club members may take turns at selecting books or faci uh, faci facilitating sessions if one is part of a park sports team sharing power may involve limited coaching terms or making sure leadership positions are open to all we can't act equitably without cultivating equity so how do we do it just like any habit it requires habitual action acting equitably once is likely to help us do it twice and ultimate and ultimately continually we can develop a habit of equity by putting ourselves in situations where we can exercise it. Cultivating equity might require we study and emulate historical role models of equity like Martin Luther King Jr. or literary examples like the Good Samaritan. Our, admi our, uh, our admiration for these role models can influence us to do as they have done. These models can also allow us to see things we hadn't seen before. In this way, according to Christian Miller, these models can reshape our moral imagination in providing us with new ways of seeing equity and fairness. Another way we can cultivate equity is by familiarizing ourselves with our unequitable desires and tendencies. Through self-reflection, we might recognize that we are the kind of person who always wants to be in control, have things go our way, or want people in charge that look like us. Once we recognize the presence of these desires, we can then be more mindful about whether they are influencing us given in a given situation and do our best to compensate for, correct, or counterbalance them. Again, this is like, if we could all be better people, it would be nice. Um, easier said than done. Uh, sure. And it's like, should we go study the lives of people who, like, did important things for, you know, other folks? Like, sure, that's a good thing. I don't know that we can really emulate, um, like, great people and then be like them. Like, I don't know if that's how it works. Now, under this theory, it is how it works. It's kind of according to Aristotle, yes. But, like, there's the old story of G.E. Moore... Uh, for people who don't know, G.E. Moore was a very important philosopher at the turn of last century, and he was one of the people that inspired Wittgenstein, uh, so t important 20th century philosopher. Apparently, he converted to Christianity um, because he ran into like a priest or something or a monk, and the monk said, look, 
All you really got to do is just consider in your action, think, what would Jesus do in this situation? And if you can think of like the great man, Jesus, the son of God, and imagine what he would do in that case, then you do that and you'll be living the good life. So G. E. Moore was very impressed with this, and he became Christian for a year by, you know, every time he had like a ethical decision, what he would do. And after a year, uh, I don't know, it was maybe reported by Russell, he stopped being Christian because he realized he had no fucking clue what Jesus would do in this, his life. Like he just didn't know. It's like how would you know? So it's like, again, you can read up on Martin Luther King Jr. and the great things that were done um, during the Civil Rights era. But is that going to actually tell you what to do now? And this actually goes back to Hume, too. Hume used to make this sort of argument. You should go look at history. Hume would say, who was, he was a historian, say, we should do that. But he also said you have to act rationally. So this is the distinction here. We don't actually know the right thing to do at any given point because, like, the historical t- time period is not now, and you can get inspiration from them. But again, you have to process that in some way, and it's not so clear how that happens. So again, like... Being equitable, like learning how to do that, yes, you should figure out how to do that. But it's easier said than done because, again, being a good person, not so easy. We should all just do it, like snap our fingers. Yeah, go right ahead, but that's not how things work. (coughs) Sally says, I think it's much easier to learn what not to do or what the shitty thing to do. Yeah. I mean, that's the negative stuff. Like, you can cut down on on the bad things. Do the right thing is hard, but don't do the shitty thing is way easier. Um, yeah. Again, that's not teaching you to be good. It's just trying to keep you out of trouble <laughs> until you figure out what you should be doing with yourself. And I think that's right. A lot of uh, instruction is just like, don't do this really crappy thing. And uh, eventually, hopefully, you'll learn why not to. But, um, yeah. But, I mean, this is an ancient problem in philosophy and everywhere else. Like, what should we be doing with our lives? How should we be doing it? No one's got an easy answer to this. And it's like, yeah, the fact that uh, Cherry is just appealing to, like, this sort of thing in an Aristotelian framework, that's fine. But, um, yeah. It's like, there's no great shakes either here. Okay. So, like, here, like, right here. See, they know they need to do more. Cultivating ethical attentiveness. So, like, they're going to tell us more about this right now. Let's see how much we got. Yeah, so we got, like, three pages. And it ends with the ultimate good. So they're biting off way more than they can chew, but they know this. So this is just how this paper is. Oh, I've been thinking more and more about getting some emotes as a... Uh, oh, Sally, you'll appreciate this because you know uh, excessive profanity. I'm thinking about getting some emotes so people can vote on the paper. So you're going to get like an emote, and if you think something is pretentious, you can drop the pretentiousness emote in chat. And then at the end of the paper, we all have like something to count up the uh, the number of emotes that have been dropped. And so similar to excessive profanities, uh, well, uh, beheadings and kicking people out of chat. Yeah, well, I was thinking about this, and, like, we can have, like, a review. So, like, in this sort of paper, you could say, you know, maybe I'll have, like, a lightweight emote. Like, something that, like, it's a little, like, a, a balloon or something for a lightweight. Because I, it's just, you know, this is fine stuff. Like, Cherry is competent. She doesn't make mistakes, but then again, she's not saying anything, like, particularly hardcore here. Like, not making big claims at the moment. Maybe something will come up in the, like, latter half of this paper, but at the moment, it just doesn't seem that way. Disney Channel so far, yeah. I mean, but like I said, this is uh you you have to just let people have some Disney Channel philosophy too. It's like there's that's okay. Like it not everything needs to be uh, crazy intense. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> Sally, it's taken me years to come up with like, and I've known about EXP for at least a year, so it's taken me a long time to come up with that. <laughs> but thank you for saying it was clever. <sighs> if civic friendship is to help address the overdoing democracy problem, then friends should also cultivate attentiveness. This involves an attunement to relative fa- to relevant facts and a dismissal of irrelevant ones. In this way, my suggestion is both similar to and different from Talese's. He thinks we should engage in non-political cooperative activities with others whose political commitments are not only unknown to us, but also beside the point. 
Here, Talese is claiming that we should not attend to someone's political commitment so as to discover what they are, but if we do discover them, they shouldn't matter anyway. If we know it, we should dismiss this fact. And this is because it's irrelevant. I take Talese to mean that civic friends should develop a disposition to be attentive to only things that matter, and since political commitments do not matter, friends should not give them any significant social or political attention. But this can't be fully right. If the, politi the point of non-political cooperative projects was to desaturate politics only, I would understand the recommendation. It's plausible to think that if we want to create a space where politics has no place, then not knowing people's political commitments would be necessary. However, this is not the only aim of civic friendship. Civic friendship, according to Talese, also aims to address the homo homo ugh, I can't say this word today, homogenous problem. But how? Because it should be a, the homogeneity problem, but not the homogenous problem. I, f I think this thing is grammatically funky for some reason. But how can we address this problem without awareness? Some knowledge is relevant and necessary. And a person who cultivates attentiveness focuses on the things that matter and dismisses things that do not. For our purposes, they would be interested in the polit political commitments of those around them, but will resist giving unfriendly weight to them. Yeah, I mean, you have to understand who you're talking to. Attentiveness, then, is the disposition to attend to certain objects. It consists in an agent's receptivity toward a certain kind of object. Ethical attentiveness involves not, o not just attentiveness to the presence of an object, for example, a person, but the formal object of attentiveness is spe specifically ethical. So it's not just being attuned to a human being, but their well-being. In our context, ethical attentiveness involves being aware of the presence of a human being and their political commitments, and it also cons consists in being attuned to their humanity, equality, and inclusion. A person may recognize someone as a Democrat. They are attentive to this political fact, but it's not ethical attentiveness if they direct their attention at the person's exclusion. For example, if they direct this salient fact at making sure the person feels out of place, othered. This is not ethical attentiveness. Ethical attentiveness, on the other hand, would involve recognizing when we have encountered a person with political commitments that are different from our own. And considering this information, we become attuned to their inclusion and humanity. Yeah, I mean, again, you have to understand why people are the way they are, and shouldn't just dismiss them outright for having different opinions. Again, easier said than done, but still, like, this is an important fact that you can understand people in different traditions. Ethical attentiveness involves not only recognition, but acting out of this recognition. Such attentiveness gives rise to a desire to help or hinder them in the co conduct of their lives. Effective ties aid in this endeavor. Attachment, as opposed to indifference, can elicit a desire to include our political opponents in our pleasure activities. I may be attuned to the fact that my best friend is currently experiencing rough times, and through ethical attentiveness, my attention is directed at her well-being. But what motivates me to do something to help her is the attachment we share. It is, our, it is of my affections toward her that I respond to the recognition. Yeah, I mean, you want to help your friends out, and you can feel like you want to engage with other people, too. Like, learn something new about other people. And you can work on that. Okay. Now, what makes civic friendships quite different from friendships we share with our close friends is that they don't require emotions like love. The attachment which I speak is not an emotional one. It's one in which we recognize that we are attached as co-citizens. It's effective ties in the sense of James Baldwin's acknowledgement between blacks and whites. Whether I like it or not, or whether you like it or not, we are bound together forever. We are part of each other. It is King's sense that love is recognition of the fact that all life is interrelated. Rather than attachment based on emotional feelings, it is attitudinal like Martin Luther King's account of love, which he describes as involving understanding, goodwill, respect, and active concern. It's an attitude of respect and active concern, one that seeks a common good in which all are included. In sum, we shouldn't want to be completely unaware of poli people's political commitments. This is not irrelevant in all cases. Such knowledge, even a vague sort, and attentiveness can let me know if I'm in a ho homogenous space. It can also help me know when I've encountered someone whom I've once viewed as a political opponent, and thus challenge and provide me with the opportunity to treat them as a friend. I mean, this is very la -di da still. Okay. But they say, however, before we get to the act of attending to those with different political commitments than our own, we need to know where they are so that we can engage them. Ethical attentiveness helps. 
Ethical attentiveness requires that we be attentive to our civic friend's absence and the locale of their presence. It involves an attunement to the fact that a sporting event has people with certain political commitments and that this, this is where we may need to go to engage in non-homogenous cooperative projects. Which person has the commitment would be irrelevant. What would matter is that the locale is in fact a place where those who we, we once saw as our political opponents may be located. And such attentiveness would direct the boundaries we cross in order to engage in these activities. So I just had a funny recollection thinking about this. I was like, you're going to get yourself shot if you go to the wrong places. If if you're lucky, just beaten or a beer thrown on you. I mean, you got to be careful sometimes. <laughs> I nearly got my ass kicked because I was in Boston when the uh, Patriots won the Super Bowl. And we got outed as uh, New Yorkers. And they were like, fuck the Yankees. They said... Someone got my buddy to say, oh, you agree to fuck the Red Sox. And he goes, yeah, yeah whatever. And <laughs> it's like, yeah, they caught us. Like, we're New Yorkers. He was just, like, not paying attention. And I almost got beaten up for being a Yankees fan on the day the Patriots won the World Series. Yeah, I, I know you're a New Englander, so you appreciate that story. But I was just thinking about this. And I've been up in Boston because I went to school up there many, many years ago. Um, and I had a buddy visiting with the Yankees hat on and I ended up having to buy people beer just because he had a loud mouth on him and uh, it's like yeah it's like you gotta be careful <laughs> but <laughs> yes go make friends with people like just because they are Red Sox fans does not make them bad people necessarily <laughs> it may be true in, in their case but like just inherently no uh, Alan provides an example of how this works when she writes about expanding her boundaries in the Chicago neighborhood of Hyde Park as an expression and requirement of political friendship. So, quote, I must develop context in which to interact with the other members of my polis, for these do not exist. Just by drawing a map of it, I have realized that my, what my neighbors and I typically recognize as our neighborhood is in fact separated from the other parts of our polis by freeways, major traffic arteries, train tracks, one large cemetery, and empty parks. Soon I learned too, with a little historical research, that these boundaries were carefully considered by an earlier mayor, Richard J. Daly, to keep Chicago neighborhoods racially segregated. My own university helped construct these boundaries, a commitment to political friendship, even in respect only to the other adults living in my immediate vicinity, requires that I cross geographical, racial, economic boundaries and challenge the habits of action and mind that my political order and its major institutions have cultivated for nearly half a century. These habits have been fostered since exactly the point when the major institutions of my polis first had a significant opportunity to invest new integrationist forms of citizenship. Yeah. Um, if you're in New York, this is in Chicago. Um, if you're in New York, uh, what was that guy's name? Oh, I'm blanking on it. Oh, man. We had uh, someone in New York that did the exact same thing, too. Loudmouth schnooks for sure. Yeah. Um, Dag nabbit. Uh, I'm blanking on the guy's name. But there was... Uh, it's the same thing in New York. We had someone that did this. He was racist. There's a reason why none of the uh, subways go to any of the airports. The subways don't go to the airports in New York. You have to get like a... You have to transfer. is because he didn't want poor people taking airplanes. And so he would break up communities. He would put arteries like he'd separate like the whites and the blacks. Um, Moses, Robert Moses. Um, yeah. Happened in Boston too. Believe it. Yeah, of course. It's happened in a lot of places in America. Leonard Nimoy's neighborhood was flat out destroyed. Yeah. Like, and um, certain, like they don't like your minority. They may just put uh, like a parking lot over it if they didn't like it. But yeah, we had a guy named Robert Moses here in New York. And there's um, a lot of, a lot of New York that is shaped due to him and his him like holding on to power for a long time and doing racist things like he didn't want poor people at the airport so the, the subways don't go to the airports like it's crazy you can't get a subway directly to the airport um you have to transfer to a secondary uh subway the air tran or you have to get a bus and it's like it like how are you gonna like transferring your luggage between like public transport is not fun like it's like it's like levels of like stupid madness yeah you you wondered <laughs> yeah it's bad um my friend actually lives in a building uh that was a robert moses building um it's really nice like she's in like one of these like buildings he built that was like really nice 
uh, he had built and it's like it's super nice she has a great view what are you doing at the, to go to the airport yeah it, it's um like it's that sort of level of like head shaking at this point like how could the subways not go to the airports but like guy was he had all the power and he didn't give a fuck and he really didn't give a fuck and he didn't have to but like that's New York <coughs> okay Martha Nussbaum also talks about this attentiveness when she describes the creation of public parks like Manhattan's Central Park Brooklyn's Prospect Park and Chicago's Burnham uh, plan Burnham plan not only were these parks created to allow for equal access to nature and retreat, but they were also places where people from diverse backgrounds could meet. The design's geography facilitates its goal, for example, with Central Park's north-south extent and Prospect Park's boundaries, which touch the immigrant communities of Flatbush and the middle-class neighborhoods of Lefferts Garden. This is interesting. I, I don't know, because these parks were before Robert Moses, so maybe people actually thought this was a good idea back in like the 1800s when these parks were set up, but like by the time Robert Moses came around, nah, that, he stopped that. These parks not only allow diverse people to enjoy nature, but they are places for them to bump into each other as they do. These are collaborative spaces, thus public space can supply an escape valve that preserves the possibility of friendship. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the old joke from uh, Crocodile Dundee. Where he's in New York and he says, how could, like, he's talking to the New Yorker and he's out from, like, the boonies in uh, Australia. He says, she says, like, there's 8 million people living there. He goes, that must be the friendliest place on the, in the world. Like, how else do people live so close to each other? It's like, yeah. Yeah, let me tell you about uh, New York. Okay. Ethical attentiveness requires an attunement to location, history, and boundaries. It requires recognizing when our own environments are, are homogeneous, where to go to collaborate with those who are different from us, and then collaborating with others despite the possibility of difference. Cultivating ethical attentiveness, addressing the sorting problem, while also facilitating non-political activities. Yeah, this whole paper is go make fucking friends with other people. Like, that's all it is. And you gotta, like, go figure out how to do it. Okay, the ultimate good. So this is, finally we're at the end here. Talese is right to conclude that flourishing both individually and collectively also depends on the realization of goods that cannot be won by politics. The oversaturation of politics and effective and belief polarization is getting in the way of us enjoying these goods. Civic friendship is a solution, but it's not a utopian one. Developing and maintaining friendships, including civic friendships, require constant work. It will not always be done perfectly, nor will it be easy, but the recommendation of cultivation reminds us that we can always nurture, develop, and improve our civic friendships even when we falter. I have argued that we should cultivate taste, equity, and ethical attentiveness as ways to do so. These are additions to Talisa's recommendations of democratic sympathy, persistence, reasonableness, etc., and are in no way replacements. Together, these characteristics and dispositions can help us get closer to enjoying the goods of our democracy, and they do so by helping us jump over obstacles that seek to get in the way of social goods, including the ultimate good of enjoying each other's humanity as we do things. Okay. And we end on, as you said, the Disney version of the world. We are enjoying each other's humanity as we do things. Because clearly, we all get along. Okay, this is sort of a... This was light fare, I think, for Mayisha, Cherry. Like, it's very nice, but there's no, like... there's. I mean, even if you look at the... Uh, bibliography, this is short. Like, this is a short... Um... <laughs> Um, this is basically, I don't know, like, what is this? Uh, no, it, so this does apply to modern politics. What this is, is this is just sort of an idealistic paper is basically what it is. And that's okay. Like you can write idealistic papers in philosophy and get them published depending on what you're doing. Like it's not, this is not published in like a major journal of philosophy. This is published in a reputable journal of philosophy. And basically maybe for all I know, this was in a like special edition where they were talking about this stuff. Like, so this is really what this feels like more to me is that this was in maybe like an edition discussing the book. And maybe that's what it is. And so if this was um, looking at this in sort of a, all right, let's discuss this Talese book in various ways. This would be a perfectly acceptable paper for a special uh, edition of a journal talking about the Talese uh, view of, um, you know, what to do about politics. And so 
like under that sort of like i don't know if that's the case but like this would be a, this is not bad work it's just not very uh groundbreaking work it's an aristotelian analysis of this and uh that's fine sally says you know when i teach networking classes i start with with this is obvious and we know it's obvious but everyone can learn from this obvious thing and that's how you start yeah and so that's how this paper started out they said one or two things that were kind of interesting but it wasn't like it was super uh they didn't super get into it and that's all that this paper was like that's nice it's not um crazy it just gave you the aristotelian perspective and a little bit of flavor basically from uh, my uh cherry's perspective of things that need to be done what needs to uh that you have to enjoy yourself with other people and that's really what's going to give you a better platform for getting along with other people not just that we can you know i scratch your back you scratch mine what can we do to work to make the country better but if we enjoy ourselves better then we will actually have a better basis for understanding how to get along and make the country better that's sure i completely agree there's nothing wrong with that but then again aristotle said that 2000 years ago updating it for current times that's also good so that's fine i mean from my perspective it's just this enjoying each other's humanity right here at the end like you always point the wrong way enjoying each other's humanity like this is what we're going to be doing i do not classify myself as an aristotelian i am way too cynical for this you are not going to like people some people suck and so this is not in just like the ultimate good of enjoying each other's humanity this is not the ultimate good in my world like you should be figuring stuff out you should enjoy some people's like uh, humanity and stuff like that but like this is not going to be the ultimate for me and so i, I find this uh, a little look this just it's too aristotelian for me and it's a little too uh like it may be unrealistic to just be always enjoying all the other people's humanity maybe you know they always say people oh always seems to get along with everybody like these are always good like that's fair but like yeah you need some like uh boundaries on this in my opinion part of humanity sounds and for shitty paper you'll enjoy theirs yeah like i don't want to hear certain people talk like they're just wrong like we just have alex jones in this country who is a terrible person he says whatever he thinks basically to get more attention because that's how he sells crap and you know he was he figured out that if you um say bad things about like people who have been in tragedy you get a lot of attention and he made a lot of money doing that he recently got um a court judgment against him in the tune of a billion dollars but he hasn't got no billion dollars the family who knows what the families will get out of it but it's like the idea that we're going to enjoy this man's humanity the man is like damaged goods as i'm as far as i'm concerned and so it's like i don't want to enjoy that person's humanity like he's damaged goods um he should not be given a platform to make noise at all anymore so it's like that's my problem with like sort of this perspective and you um like what's your view of humanity in that case you also have to remember and it gets brought up every so often on stream aristotle was a shitty guy too he wasn't like the cool dude like he, people did not like him he was a rich kid aristotle was a rich kid he sucked up to other like to powerful rulers people didn't like aristotle and so the idea that like you're just going to enjoy people's humanity like aristotle didn't want to hang out with poor i doubt aristotle wanted to hang out with poor people like so this sort of philosophy is just like i don't think like this is actually how we get along with other people because it's too rosy a view of how uh interpersonal relations happen and what they are like, well, you're not going to like people. You're going to get angry with people. And, like, the universal thing, like, you're just going to, like, oh, if you understand people enough that you're going to get along, that that's a little too rosy for me. I mean, I might be wrong. I might be old and grumpy at this point. But, um, yeah. At least it's not my birthday. <laughs> so, okay. But, like I said, okay, paper. It's, um, like just sort of one perspective the aristotelian on a uh thing here sally says i'm going to understand people enough that i get along with them by avoiding wh where possible yeah like some people it's just better to you know <clears throat> what was the old thing it's just better to keep your mouth shut and sometimes you just do have to keep your mouth shut the uh, old late night host comedian Craig Ferguson, he was said he had three wives. He was finally into his third wife before he realized there should be a decision procedure before he ever speaks. First question you ask yourself, does this need to be said? Like when his wife 
when he's thinking about saying something that his wife will be angry about. Does this need to be said? Does this need to be said right now? No, does this need to be said by me? And does this need to be said by me right now? If you if he can't answer yes to all three of those things, he keeps his mouth shut. And I think a lot of people need to would do well to understand. It doesn't need to be said. It doesn't need to be said by me. And it doesn't need to be said by me right now. So it's like, yes. <clears throat> but I, 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 if you are going to open your mouth, like, please ask, ask those three questions. <laughs> yeah. But okay, so like this is an overdoing democracy 2019. So we've got some, uh, that's what the years on this were. Um, so yeah. Oh, yeah. good night, Sally. Thank you for being here. I'm ending stream too. This is, um, uh, glad you stuck it out to the end. Yeah, not every, <laughs> I know I lose people, but I'm going to go raid anywhere, uh, see if there's anyone else to do. Have a great night. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it.